My name is Adria, um, and I've been the associate pastor here at BCC for about four and a half months. Uh, someone was just asking me again this morning, and I was trying to do the math. Um, and I'm really enjoying getting to know you all, getting to know, know you a little bit of your story individually as a church, uh, what God is doing in and through you as a community. I'm learning kind of gradually how you do things, why, you, and so forth. And um, many of you know that I've served mostly in smaller churches up, in, up until now or in, hospice or in hospital chaplaincy as well. But most of the churches I've served have been smaller ones. Some of them have also been declining. So one of the things that was a pleasant surprise for me was how much is going on in this church? <laughs> how much is going on in, even in the building that there's always people coming and going? And if you look at the church calendar, there's, always, there's something here in the building almost every day that there are Bible studies and preschool and meetings and you know, uh, important conversations. You'll hear laughter and there'll be prayer and spiritual direction happening in our prayer room and, and meals being made and eaten and meals being made and taken to the homeless. There's a lot of things happening, a lot of really good things happening in this building and among us as a church. You are all growing, as we saw this morning. You're growing not just in numbers, but working. I've been hearing stories of what God has been doing in your life, some deep changes, um, and that is so awesome to see. There's a lot going on in this life, and I've become a part of it. <laughs> I'm gradually... Um, my days have become full too. Sorry, I don't know if it's the glasses or my earrings or what, but this moves. Um, so lots of, here, I'll try it without my glasses. Maybe that'll help. Um, what? Red mic. Red mic. Let me try this just a little longer and then see if that helps. Um, so my days are getting full, full of good things. Uh, maybe some of, them, some of them not so, so good, but mostly good things. Um, it's easy for me to want to stick my nose into everything, and I'm trying not to do that. So, <laughs> And this week is Holy Week, something that the, many of you, the church staff, and many of you have been planning for, thinking of for months and months, and there's lots of events, as we heard. It's in the bulletin. It's in the inserts online. Um, lots of ways to remember and reflect on Jesus last week before his death and resurrection. So how do we sustain it all? How do we sustain it all? How do we keep going as a community doing all of the things? How do we do all of it? The worship, the study, the service, the administration, the leadership, the care, the outreach, the meals, the prayer, the preschool. The... And how do you, as an individual and as a family, as a couple, how do you do life every day and do all of the things? Things for God, things for your family, things for work. How do you sustain it all? Well, you hear the kids, you have to, in order to stay alive, you have to stay connected to the vine. You have to stay connected to the true vine. The true vine is the source of our life, the source of strength, the source of energy, our direction, our motivation, our very reason for being. Jesus, the true vine, is the reason why we do it all. The reason why we are here doing stuff at church. It's because of him, it's for him, it's with him, it's by him. Life with God, or life for God, is a matter of remaining connected to the vine. It's about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and then he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And these are slightly different things with different nuances, different layers of meaning. I'm just going to look at a couple of those layers of meaning um, briefly and how they're connected. Jesus is again making a statement of who he is, his identity, but he's also teaching us about his purpose, his, his life among us, what he can do, his life with him, who he is for us. He says, I am the true vine, and this would have been explosive in the first century. It's where you get used to hearing. Uh, but because in the Old Testament, the vine was actually is The vine was Israel, the people of God. Um, picture of a vine here. And then I have Psalm 80. It says, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. This is the psalmist talking to God. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. 
So Israel was the vine. And then um, other books pick up this image of a vine, of a vineyard, and um, how God has planted it. He protects it. He tends it. And actually in Isaiah 5, it, we have this God calling Israel his vineyard and saying, why is it producing wild or bad fruit and not the good fruit? And other Old Testament prophets pick up this image as well. And the, the emphasis all through this is on the action of God in choosing Israel. The action of God establishing them, tending them, caring for them. How Israel belonged to the Lord, the creator of the universe. And this metaphor of the vine or the vineyard became a favorite picture in Israel. Actually, can I go back? Oh, there we go. So it became a favorite picture of Israel among the Jewish people. You see it in their literature. You even see it on their coins. And in the direct decorations of the temple, some people say there was this big gold vine on the outside of the temple. And we might understand then how it might have contributed to some complacency. Some complacency in the time of the, the later Old Testament prophets, but certainly by the time of Jesus. That if they were part of the vineyard, they were okay. That if they were a part of the vineyard of Israel, they're almost automatically God's people. If they were Hebrews, part of Israel, they were part of God's chosen people. Therefore, they were afforded the protection, the care of God. They would be rescued by God. They were God's special people. And then here comes Jesus. Can you understand why this is kind of turning things upside down for them? Here comes Jesus saying, I am the true vine. I am the vine. They would have known what he was referring to because it's all around them, this imagery of the vine in the vineyard. <clears throat> and he's saying that the way to God is now through him. God's people are now those who are attached to Jesus. It's not just being a part of the vineyard anymore or being a part of the Israelite Jewish people. There is a new order of things. The way to God and all that God offers is through Jesus. Instead of asking whether they were a part of Israel, <clears throat> Israel, the vineyard, now has to ask whether it's a part of Jesus, whether it's attached to Jesus or to God. So if Jesus is the true vine, then being attached to him means everything, doesn't it? It means being connected to the vital source of life. Since God is the one that gives life and God is the source of all good things, then being connected to Jesus means being connected to everything that is good, to life. As one writer said, to fail to have Jesus is to fail to have life. To fail to have Jesus is to fail to have life. In order to sustain a life in this world at all, we must remain connected to Jesus. This is the person, the, the way that God provided to stay connected to him. The way that God showed us who he is, the way that God is providing his life and his love, it's through this person, Jesus Christ. So then Jesus changes the image a little bit and he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Remain in me. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you remember, this is the last evening, this part of this long conversation in John on the last evening before his death. And so he's been telling the disciples that he's going to be leaving them and all these hard things are happening. He's talking about the troubled events and it, that are coming, that life is troubled, the world is hard. And so he's saying, and then he knows that they, he's going to die and he's going to be separate from them for a couple days and that they're going to have all these doubts and questions. And so he says, remain in me. Remain in me. Stay connected to me. So for us, remain in me, abide in me, means being utterly dependent on Jesus. He knows that at, even after his resurrection and after he goes back into heaven, there's going to be times when they're going to doubt their faith and they're going to be facing persecution in the world. And so Jesus says, remain connected to me. You can't do any of that. And any, any of the things that he's asked them to do without staying connected to him. And on this night is the night where he gives them his, his the greatest commandment, love um, one another just as I have loved you. We call Monday, Thursday, um, it comes from the Latin mandato or commandment. 
Um, Jesus gave them this commandment, love one another, remain in my love, love one another because of my love. And they can't do that without Jesus. They can't be dependent on Jesus. I mean, they can't do any of the things that God asked them to do without remaining in his love. So I grew up in a Christian family. Um, I grew up in um, a missionary household, and so, of course, we kind of thought we were cool. I mean, no, nobody else in the world thought we were cool, but we thought we were cool. Um, so um, we, we kind of, like, I think I grew up kind of thinking that I was a super Christian. And, it, and I, I was blessed with, like, where if I worked hard and I studied hard, things kind of went well. And um, that's not always the case for everybody. And, and because of the privilege I was born into, things generally went okay in my life. I mean, I suffered, I don't mean that, but if I worked hard in school, if I worked hard for a job, things like that, things, things worked out. And it kind of, all of those things together kind of led me to think that I was doing it. And all I had to do to make it in life was to work hard. Um, and it, I think, I don't remember when it happened. I think there were a couple times, maybe right after college when my support system was taken away and I was working in some difficult, a difficult position and um, a difficult job. And I started realizing that I just didn't have anything left. And it was really too hard to be a good person. It was, I was a, re, um, a perfectionist still. I'm like a recovering perfectionist now. Um, <laughs> at least I hope. Um, and a recovering people pleaser, which is an awful combination, let me tell you. It just, you're just in agony all the time, trying to get things right and trying to keep people happy and trying to gain people's approval. And I remember there was a day when I was sitting in church, and, and it started with this, it wasn't only this, but it started with this. I was sitting in church thinking about how everybody else was listening to the sermon, and I think God said, actually, this sermon is for you. <laughs> I was like, oh, like, it, I'm in church for me. Not like because this is the right thing to do, but actually the sermon is for me too. And it started this process and um, I mean, it took a lot of um, talking with people, talking to um, some spiritual mentors, um, a lot, a long growing process and coming to a point where like, you know, I just don't, I can't do this on my own. I can't be perfect. I can't be keep people happy. I mean, I remember even as a, um, pastor in the space of one hour in, after a church when I was a new pastor. I think it was, yeah, it was my first church, and there was one Sunday where um, I was fairly new, and someone came up to me in what I call the receiving line, just, I don't know what else to call it, but at the back of the church, and said, Pastor, we just love your preaching. You could preach for 45 minutes. It would be wonderful. You know, my pastor, my old pastor, of course, you know, everybody compares me to the old pastor, my old pastor, well, you could preach for an hour. It would be wonderful. I was like, wow. Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm not going to, I don't have that in me for sure. And I'm not even kidding. Like 15, 20 minutes later, we're standing in the coffee line and overheard one of the young people say, you know, I love that you just do 20-minute sermons. Like, <laughs> it's just, I don't have much more. People's attention spans are so much shorter. You know, have you ever even thought of doing like a 12, 15-minute sermon? Maybe that would be better for bringing in the... And, I, and it just like, I was like, if I tried to keep people happy, I would go nuts. Like if I tried to keep everybody happy in the church. So those kind of experiences started helping me understand and see and coming to the bottom of myself. Coming to the bottom of myself through some of the difficult times and saying, I just can't do this. I can't be a good Christian. I can't be a good pastor. I can't please everybody. I can't be perfect. I can't love other people. Um, there are days when I, can't, I don't even like my family. You expect me to love them? Um, that I could only do it by depending on Jesus. That I could only do it by spending time with Jesus, spending time in his word. And part of my journey has been learning what that means. What does that mean to remain in Jesus, to depend on Jesus? For me, it's... it's, it's uh, looking at the things that bring me joy, um, but also the things that the things that God tells us where He is, like in Scripture, in worship, um, in community, in nature. Even God says that He's there. Uh, walking in nature and crea creativity. When I look at art or make art, 
Those things um, are ways that I connect with God. And I have to do those to stay alive in my faith. I have to do those things to keep going. And I, even as a pastor, you would think that we're just naturally holy people or naturally loving, good people. You know, there are a lot of pastors out there that actually don't like people very much. <laughs> I'm not one of them. I just try to keep them all happy. But um, we have to depend on God. One of my prayers is, God, continue to give me love for your people, compassion for your people, so that I'm not loving you out of my will because... Honestly, that doesn't last very long. When people disappoint you, it's hard to keep loving them. You have to depend on the love of God coming through you, the peace of God coming through you, the joy of God coming through you. You have to. There are things that we do to connect with God, sure, and that's why we talk a lot in this church about spiritual disciplines, spiritual habits, spiritual practices, things that you can do to put yourself in a place where God can minister to you to put you in that place where you remain dependent on him. Wow, I've walked away from my notes. So, let me ask you to, to, as a final question, first, are you connected to the true vine, Jesus? Are you connected to the true vine? Because let me tell you, life is not worth living without Jesus. Are you connected to the true vine? And then, are you spending time with him? Are you spending the time with the true vine, the source of all life, the very source of power and motivation and energy, the source of all good things? Because that is the only way to do all of the things. That is the only way to be the person who God created you to be, for us to be a church, to be the church that God has called us to be. It's the only way someday, the only way to survive the hard things in life is to stay, and to stay faithful to God is to be connected to that source of life and love. One of the things we're doing, as, as Phil mentioned during Holy Week, is bringing forth our broken pieces. So during this next song, as we sing, maybe you need to, to sit or kneel or stand. Um, I want you to be thinking about maybe what's dead or broken in you, what needs life, what areas of dryness are in you, Uh, And if you brought a broken piece um, with you, you can bring it up during this next song. Um, And maybe just be using this time to keep reflecting. Is there something that you need to give to Jesus for his life, for his life to renew you, to revive you? And And are you, back to that question, are you connected to Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your scripture and for the reminder it was to me even this week that I cannot do this without you. That we cannot be the people you want us to be. We can't even live life without you. God, I pray that you will keep reminding us that our true life, our true source of happiness, of joy, of peace, of love, of forgiveness, of renewal, of healing, All of that is to be found in you and you alone. Draw us nearer to you. And especially during this week, Holy Week, help us to reflect on our connection to you and what you have done for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.